Welcome, everybody. The Severe Setup is back. Episode 7, I think this is, even though we did list it as, uh, as the wrong number on it. It's seven episodes deep, Harry. Who, who would have done we got That's there? Right. That place was. We're only in mid-February, and we're already seven deep. So um, this week, we're going to get you guys set up. UFC Mexico City card this Saturday night. Another big card as well. Bellator versus PFL. We're going to touch on briefly myself and sean do have a full preview of that card up on the patreon if you're interested in that and of course we're going to talk about the the ufc main event announcement and that was a fight between alex Pejea and jamal hill that has finally set up the ufc 300 card with a main event um but as i said first of all hit the like button hit the subscribe button if you like what you're hearing today we're going to give in uh, just a quick overview of the top two fights and a quick preview of the rest of the card for this Mexico City card ahead of that other, those other two topics. Let's get straight into it. Brandon Moreno versus Brandon Royval. Main event, UFC Mexico City this Saturday in the flyweight division. Um, a fight that kind of was put together on short notice. Amir Albazi forced to pull out of this main event slot against Moreno. Brandon Royval, fresh off of his title defeat by the hands of Alejandro Pantoja in December, stepping right back in here again. Um, and I'm just going to go straight in here. This has like shades of Dan Ige, Andre Feely attached to it here. Um, Royval in a situation where he is fighting that this fight i think a little bit sooner than he would have wanted but he was likely paid a nice little fee to come in here and, and take up the headline spot so you can't um really criticize him all that much for that harry but i don't feel that we're going to see the best of brandon royval here and i feel that you know brandon moreno is definitely going to take advantage of that look it's a sick fight and it's a sick fight because royval comes in with two kitchen sinks in his pocket and a returns receipt from B and Q, and he's got plenty. Right now, we have seen Roy Val just get a bit too wild, a bit too reckless. We we obviously know he's just off the back of a five round camp already, not just a camp, but a title shot camp. And every fighter that's fought for a title will tell you that those those title camps hit just a little bit different. You're really making sure that you're xing every crossing every I and dotting every T and uh, I've said that the wrong way around, but fair play to me. It's uh, <laughs> off one in the morning here in London. And, um, you know, forgivable. I am, I am very, very, very interested to see what level of intensity Brandon Royville is going to be able to bring here. I think I agree with you mostly on the lines that it's a tough old place to go to in Mexico with a title uh, it's not, not a title fight, but with a card full of Mexican fighters. If this turns out similar to UFC London on that 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 legendary card in May where all the hometown fighters start winning and winning well, by the time that Brandon Royval walks out to meet Brandon Moreno in the middle of that arena, he will feel like he is the only man in the world that is not Mexican. And... That is a very, very, very daunting prospect to go into. Equally, Brandon Moreno will feel like a fucking superhuman when he walks out to that crowd. And I just, I really love Brandon Moreno's style. I think it's perfect for the weight division. I think it's perfect for this type of fight. I think he hits a little bit harder than Brandon Royval. I think he controls the scrambles a little bit better than Brandon Royval. I think his defensive work is a little bit better than Brandon Royval. And equally, I don't think I've ever seen Brandon Moreno get tired. And I think there is an elevation question that we have to deal with here. I'm, I'm glad you said that because it was the point I was going to come in after that. I think when we're talking about all of these fights, we've got to realize that this fight card is in Mexico City. Now has high elevation um, in there. And we and I think it, it, I think it kind of plays into the fact that this entire card overall, the heaviest weight class that is fighting, is one fight in what or two fights at 155 pounds. We don't have anybody above 170 fighting on this card. I think that's a good thing, to be honest, because we've seen what happens at high elevation is that the gas tank is going to wear out a little bit quicker. 
the problem for the high elevation here in the main event is both of these guys, Brandon Moreno and Brandon Royval, have serious gas tanks. Now, I'm wondering what capabilities Royval is at because, you know, he has a quick turnaround, but I can be sure Brandon Moreno has been training for this elevation because even if you are people like Moreno and Royval and you do have serious gas tanks, it's still going to affect you in there, Harry, isn't it? You're damn right it is. You're damn fucking right it is. And I agree with you entirely that it's 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 very smart by the UFC to not put big meaty men doing big meaty things on this card. I really also like that it is a showcase for the lighter weight classes. I think that's sort of synonymous with the Mexican scene. It's like the old that's... WC days. It's, it's great. Like uh, the lighter, lighter card. And those are always fantastic cards that as well. And I think this it would be smart with in this card to to kind of showcase it like that because we're not going to have any momentum killers here. Like I I really don't think it's going to happen. Like we we might in terms of maybe one fight not beating living up to expectation or maybe just not being a good fight. But there's a difference between that happening when a fight is being fought at a good pace and then just two guys being flat out wrecked and and just things getting sloppy and ugly and it's just not enjoyable to watch sometimes. So I think very smart move here to kind of match this fight the way it has been matched. I agree. I think the only thing that was missing, was hard. I think the only thing that this, this card is missing is Diego Lopez. That's the only thing that this card is missing is that man doing mad bastardry off his back? But I think over and above the fight. Would you be, are you saying that because he's of his Mexican her heritage, or yeah, 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 he's he's Brazilian? I thought. Is he? Have I fucked that up completely? I'm like, gonna go find out. Nice oh. hair, Diego Lopez. That fought Mavzar Evelev. Yeah, yeah. I'm almost certain that he's Brazilian. To be honest, I'm checking now. Uh, and I apologize in advance if I'm wrong. You are completely correct, and I have absolutely fucked it. I apologize to Diego Lopez and the nation of Brazil. Um, but look at I not I don't disagree with you. I love to fucking see him on this card as well because yeah. I just enjoy, I just quite enjoy um, watching him fight. But yeah, like I I I think the main event is is fantastic. I think Brandon Royval probably gets it done inside five. I suspect a a slightly later finish than than he would do. There is an element whereby you could argue that Brandon Royval, you know, he's just come out of training camp, so his fitness is already quite high, his energy is already quite high, and he can just essentially continue camp, right, and try to try to keep those those levels high. But it was a very tough fight, and you don't come out of fights yeah. like that without injury, without knocks, without little bits of setbacks here and there. And so, yeah, this is a this is a and tough. He, and he definitely work. didn't continue camp here because he he had a he had a probably around a three four week turnover there where he was definitely not and and rightly so after coming off a championship fight he's looking out he's looking out for himself he's having a good time so but I do get you to get back to where you need to be he's not necessarily coming off the couch he will be able to maintain that level of cardio that level of sharpness. Uh, and that high level training that you need go when you're when you're coming into a fight like this. The fact it being five rounds, I think in this particular case, given the circumstances, I feel it will suit Moreno a lot better than it will suit Roy Val. And I'm very curious to see how it goes down. Up the flyweights, hashtag fly never die. We're getting a flyweight main event, and I'm always going to shout from the rooftops when we do get that one. So I'm very, very excited. Look at there's no questioning the Mexican heritage of the two fighters in the co-main event, Harry. And this is a rematch between Yair Rodriguez and Brian Ortega in the featherweight division, a fight that, you know, definitely has a lot more interest after what we seen last weekend between Ilya Teporia and Alexander Volkanovsky. The winner of this fight could really find themselves in the number one contendership fight uh, or in, in the number one contender slot and fighting for the championship if things don't work out with the rematch between Alex Volkanovsky and... Um, Ilya Teporia. We've seen Yair, we've seen Ortega in there before. The fight, if nobody remembers, was a, an interesting first round, a fight that, a round that I scored for Brian Ortega, a round that he was doing quite well uh, in the striking exchanges, a lot better than I would have been expected him against Yair Rodriguez. Um, obviously, uh, had some good grappling exchanges as well, hurt his shoulder. Uh, and was not able to continue the fight uh, after round one. 
Um, thus, uh, it being rewarded to Yair Rodriguez, he gets the chance to kind of turn that around, and we hopefully, fingers crossed, get to see the full landscape of this fight uh, after what we've seen in the last one. Harry, what do you take away from that last fight between these two men, and 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 how do you see this one playing out in the Comian event? Uh, what do I take from it? Basically, nothing. Um, we didn't get to see enough in order for me to really form an opinion. Brian Ortega is somebody that we have been waiting and begging for him to reach his full potential for a long, 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 long time. Um, I haven't heard much from Brian Ortega since that fight, which is potentially a good thing, potentially a bad thing. Um, I hope that his shoulder is is up to full strength here. We know exactly what Yaya Rodriguez is bringing. He's bringing a high volume of kicks, a lot, a lot of power, a very, very, very fast round one, a very, very fast round two, and then a slightly less fast round three, a slightly less round four, and a slightly less round five. What we do know from Yair is that he is susceptible to being taken down. And obviously, if you're taken down by Brian Ortega, that's a very, very, very tough place to be. And so I think the the battle for this, and I'm going to steal both a Harry and Ian line here, the battle for this is one in the ranges. If Yair can keep Ortega out on the outside, land the kicks. When Ortega comes inside, land the shots, land the elbows. Yair will start to control the fight. We know that Brian Ortega is susceptible to, to taking a beating and to sort of being the nail and then pulling something out of the madness. And so Yair would have to be absolutely laser focused the entire fight. I think for Brian Ortega, if he comes out and looks anything like the Chang Song Jung fight, on the feet, then we're in for a very, very, very interesting back and forth battle. Well, do you agree that this should be a number one contendership fight within the 145 pound division? Not really. Like, I think these fellas have had so many opportunities at, at the elite level. Um, I wouldn't be mad if they if they aren't doing the Alexander Volkanovsky rematch. I wouldn't be mad at chucking in a Movsarov Loyev with maybe a one more or whatever it is. But I think uh, what we know about the UFC is that is that stars get title fights. And so if Brian Ortega goes in and wins here, I think he gets a title shot. While it's a fresh matchup. Um, and so that's that's cool to see. Two, I think if Yair Rodriguez goes in, you can sell that fight very, very, very easily. Yair's style versus Taporia's style is fireworks. And so uh, I can see them doing it. But I wouldn't be mad at as I said on the breakdown, bringing in a brand new era of, of 145 power fighters. Yeah, and that's what Elia Taporia is hoping to try and achieve uh, as well within the division. And, you know, I can't argue against that too. We've been calling for that little bit of freshness. We're, we're, we're seeing it now with all the champions. I mean, Alexander Volkanovsky was previously the longest reigning champion in the featherweight division. Uh, he has been dethroned. Uh, who would it be now? I guess maybe, geez, Leon Edwards, perhaps. I don't know. It's uh, that's been definitely one. It is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good shout. Left, well, well picked out. There you go. I have fresh. The, you really oh, need um, fucking quiz, didn't you? Hey, the quiz, and yeah, that's the quiz mind in me now. If you haven't uh, checked it out yet, definitely check out the MMA Mastermind or Severe MMA Mastermind on it. Very, very fun. Uh, sequence of events in that little quiz there. Looking at the rest of the Mexico City card, real, real quick here. Let's uh, run down through the card. Daniel Zellhuber versus uh, Francisco Parado at 155 takes up the main card. Rahul Rosas Jr. against Ricky Turquias, um in the 135 pound division. Um, also on the main card, Yasmin Yaraguay versus your girl Sam Hughes, Harry. Very interesting fight there. Manel Torres takes on Scotland's Chris Duncan to open up the main card. Um, right. What are your thoughts on a, on a couple of those fights that I went through there? I think Uruguay, Sam Hughes is a banger. Uh, Raul Rosas Jr., Ricky Tercios is a tough stylistic matchup, but I think it's the right kind of level for Raul Rosas Jr. Um, Zell Huber and Prado will be a fucking war. Prado doesn't know how to do anything but throw hands at 100%. Zell Huber's long, got a nice DOS on him, can crack a little piece. Uh, I think Manuel Torres versus Chris Duncan might be fight of the night, so watch out for that one. Um, all in all, a very, very, very strong main card, full, full, full of, of Mexican talent. Fair play. 
And the Mexican talent kind of continues down into the prelim section of the card. Christian Quinones versus Ronnie Barcelos at 135 to headline the prelim card is a banger as well. We got Jesus Aguilar versus Mateus Mandonca from Brazil at 125. Edgar Chariez versus Daniel Lacerda at 125 as well. We've got Claudio Puelez who takes on Faris Zaim. At 155 on the prelims, that's a banger as well, if you ask me. Luis Rodriguez versus Denise Bodner. Um, we have Victor Alm- Altamarino versus F- Felipe de Santos at 125. Mohamed Naema versus Eric Silva to kick us off. This is a fucking spicy card. I don't care what anybody says. Mohamed Naema uh, at the start is uh, the Tshikizan uh, fighter. With wins over Jamie Malarkey and Nathaniel Rudd in his last two fights. Um, he's a dirty really, bastard. Really, he's, he is a, a He's what? He's a dirty bastard. Eye pokes, groin shots against Nathaniel Wood, <laughs> fingers inside the gloves, the lot. Yeah, there was a lot of cheating, actually. I remember that, I remember that now. Yeah, as, as the great... Uh, as the great, what was his name? Ricky Bobby said, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, I guess. And, uh, and definitely in the name of... Uh, um, spoke true to that in that last fight. Looking at the rest of this card, Cronones Barcelos is a banger as well. Like I said, Puelles versus Faris Saim. That's an interesting fight in, in, in the 155 pound division. Obviously, we talked about Puelles briefly on the breakdown this week. He's that knee bar specialist. I'm not sure how that well that is going to work. Obviously, Saim is uh, uh, a good striker, so it could be a battle of where this fight goes and 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 to to see what happens in that one. But um, anything else on the on the prelim section of this car that's really standing out to you harry bet the house that edgar chiarez versus daniel lacerda does not reach a decision daniel lacerda does not know how to win a fight without getting fucking molly whopped at least once in a round so edgar chiarez uh he jumps guillotines which makes me really 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 sad but he has a wicked body hook and he throws some nasty, nasty, nasty leg kicks. So uh, that one will be a banger as well. Nice one. I'm just going to try and see if I can get the under on that fight there as well for anyone who might be interested in it. Alasareda versus Sherrod. Not up yet on Bet365. God damn it, Bet365. Why would you be doing that to us? But look at, as I said, the UFC Mexico City card for a fight night card in front of a crowd. It's that tiered system that we're dealing with, the pay-per-view, the fight night in front of crowds, and the UFC Apex cards. This falls right in the middle. Very interesting fight. I like how they've structured this card. I like the matchups on this card. It's shaped up for entertainment. If you're on the fence about watching this one, I would highly recommend you get involved and do that. Before before this fight go, or this card goes down, Harry, we have... The big Bellator versus PFL champions versus champions card. Sean and I do a full on breakdown of this card in total. I wanted to speak about this card solely for the reason that I want to get your opinion on the card as a whole. The idea of the card, what you think of the card, your excitement level for the card, and maybe some fights that you know uh, you're looking forward to watching on the card as well, Harry. Sure thing. So I really like the idea. Let's start there. Um, I think it's a really nice way to sort of unify both of the organizations in a way that doesn't really spark a drastic amount of rivalry between them, but it feels more like a showcase of everything that that both organizations have had to offer, right? Henan Ferreira versus Ryan Bader is your main event. Um, fair, right? They're two big guys. I understand what's happening here. Um, this is, you know, following one of your more archetypical card layouts, if you will, that you put the big guys at the top. Uh, Impa Kasanganai versus Johnny Eblen. I mean, that's a tough fight for Impa Kasanganai because Johnny Eblen is an absolutely fantastic fighter, but that's a good fight altogether. Jason Jackson versus Ray Cooper the third is a great fight. Bruno Capoloza versus Vadim Nemkov might be the actual best fight on the card. Um, and then Tiago Santos versus Raul Ma- Yo Romero. That would have been fun if Tiago Santos had two knees and if Yo Romero wasn't 473 years old. Um, I am <laughs> absolutely fascinated by Clay Collard versus AJ McKee Jr. and by Braga versus Pico. Um, yeah. I think both of those are absolutely fantastic fights. Fair play to Closer Shields for donning the gloves one more time. Um, and yeah, all, all, all in all, 
I think it is a really, really interesting idea. I like the way that they are trying to market both organizations. It would be cool if we get to see something similar to this maybe once a year. Or... I think that's what, that's what they're trying to do, I think, and I think that's a good idea as well. But with cards like this, and I think my only you know criticism, which isn't the fault of, of, of either one of these promotions, I guess they're both under the same umbrella now, but... We're only getting to see one, if not two, champion versus champion fights on this. And that's uh, Henan Fair and Ryan Brader, Johnny Eblen versus Inca, Impact Kasangani. So, look, at uh, we had one of the best fights on the card, in my opinion. Jesus Pinedo and Patricio Pitbull fall off this card. would have been a very interesting fight. We had Magomed, Magomed Karamov, who fell out against Jason Jackson as well. But nonetheless, I still think this is a very, very interesting fight with lots of exciting prospects on it. That Pico Braga fight insanely good fight i'm really looking forward to that clay collard versus aj mckee um will be interesting as well potentially santos and romero could be a barn burner but it's more likely not going to be uh given what we've seen in recent fights it's not likely going to be uh a, a kind of a, a standoff i would imagine interesting to see what vadim nemkov does at heavyweight like you said as well Johnny Eblen versus Impact Kasangani. I think that's a bad, bad fight for Impact Kasangani. I have Kasangani. some breaking news. Yes? I have some breaking news. Uh, Gabriel Braga substitutes for Jesus Pinedo and is fighting Patricio Pitbull on the Bellator versus PFL card. Well, wow, what time in there? What time in there? Where did we see uh, this? Just put it out. Who was it? Caposa. Caposa just put it out. So where does that leave Aaron Pico? Good question. Um, try to find out a little bit more about that, and that is very, very. It's crazy how that news kind of broke, uh, right as we were talking about the fight. Ryan Bader, Hen and Fea, a decent fight to um to kind of start up the fight. Well, I know you're kind of in the middle of trying to search that out. I have a couple of questions about this card. Um, that before we can kind of get into it, Harry. The first one being, um, Fea versus Bader, top of the card. Do you think it's a mistake that PFL haven't been kind of labeling this as a fight uh, with the winner potentially taking on Francis Ngannou uh, uh, maybe later on this year? Yes, possibly. Um, by the way, MMA Fighting have have confirmed it 10 minutes ago. So I would say that that is happening. The the slag to the headline says, Gabriel Braga versus Patricio Pitbull set for BF, PFL versus Bellator. Aaron Pico expected to stay on the card. So that is a fucking short note fight for Aaron Pico. Um, short note, it's forever about Aaron Pico. He's been preparing. Imagine about the poor fucker who's going to be coming absolutely. in to take him on. Absolutely. Uh, very curious to see what to do with that one now. Mm. Indeed. Um, there you go. Breaking news on the severe setup this week. A live reaction to turning of events and. Just as we we're talking about fights falling out and fights being changed up, we're, we're, we've witnessed it live here. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with Aaron Pico. Um, back to your yeah, question. Back, uh, back to your question about the, the, the Francis Ngannou and, and, and heavyweight thing. Um, look, I mean, I just don't believe that Francis Ngannou is going to fight MMA ever again. I just, yeah. I just don't know if I believe it. Like, if he's going, he has gone in to what was labeled a freak show against Tyson Fury. It was labeled a, a one night thing. It was labeled a, he's going to get one payday and then that's it. Forget about it. He's not a boxer. He can't do this. He can't do that. And now he's fighting Anthony Joshua for tens of millions of dollars in Saudi Arabia. And it doesn't stop there. Do you know what I mean? Even if yeah. he loses to Joshua and it looks competitive, then there's going to be another one. You know, this isn't going to be the last. And so why would he fight MMA, which is far more dangerous, far more high stakes for Less money. I just, I just, I just, I just, I just don't see why he would. Yeah, that's a fair point. It's a fair point. Why I brought it up again. Question number two. Uh, you said fair play to Cl Clarissa Shields. Am I on an island in saying that I don't really have any kind of interest in Cl Clarissa Shields fighting mixed martial arts? Why are we? I understand why we are. It's a name. It might add a little bit of interest, but. We're talking about a person that I don't think is fully committed to mixed martial arts, won't ever be fully committed to mixed martial arts. And I'd like to see someone coming in here with more of a backbone in mixed martial arts. Like, give me a, a, a Kieran Clark here. Or give me someone that's, like, committed to mixed martial arts and showcase their abilities rather than bringing Clarissa Shields in here 
um, to showcase probably a lack of takedown defense again. Obviously, she'll have that striking, but I don't know about this one. What are your thoughts on that, Harry? Look, Clarissa Shields is on Twitter every day trying to get a call, trying to trying, trying to get a fight with a fella. Uh, there's there's a fella that she trained with once. I can't remember his name. I don't know boxing very well. I apologize. Well, knocked her out. Yeah, the fella that that knocked her out, and and she's trying to get a fight with him. Like, what are we? What are, what are, what are we doing, lads? Um, but I agree. I understand completely why PFL are doing this. I, I don't think you can you can uh, you can argue them too much like they know what they're doing as well Clarissa Shields isn't going to be a champion Clarissa Shields is in her late 30s already she's not making a run in MMA but if the PFL can can you know make a couple of quid off her then then fair enough they should do that that's their prerogative as a business but I agree uh uh chuck in a Nathan Kelly chuck in uh a Kieran Clark chuck in a Lewis McGrillen chuck in you know a Dakota DeChava any of these type of fighters that you really want to start shining a light on we we'll just do that here why not? Absolutely. Absolutely. Last question on this card. Pay-per-view. Hit or miss for to put this on a pay-per-view. I think they're charging 60 bucks. Yeah, huge miss. You gotta showcase. You gotta showcase this, and you're not going to be able to showcase this when it's behind a, a $60 paywall. Uh, especially one week after a, a stacked UFC card as well. Um, it's asking a lot from the mixed martial arts fans and I on during the day as well in on a saturday i would be looking forward to seeing the numbers on that i don't expect them to be that great but like i said that card will go down early saturday ufc mexico will follow that last but not least what we're going to discuss is the announcement of alex Bahia versus jamal hill uh as your ufc 300 main event excitement levels for this fight harry let's let's strip away where it is right now there's just excitement levels for this fight on its own because it's quite high for me i mean you could put i think you could put alex behe in there with, with, with my granny at this stage and i'd be still happy to watch him fight i just he is a team o'neill guy alex behe i love watching him fight glad to get to see him on 300 look at there's lots of so lots of kind of tangibles, all their stuff that we could talk about. Is it a, a blockbuster main event for a card like 300? Probably not, but it's kind of a customs to the product that we have been receiving from the UFC lately, which is an overall great card for UFC 300 uh, with a really interesting and, and and a likely very exciting main event in, in Pahaya and Jamal Hill. I'd be I'd be shocked if Pahaya Jamal Hill went five rounds. Um, I think overall it's a sick fight. Uh, I think both guys hit hard, both guys are long, both guys strike well. You know, it's it's the type of banger that, that you would want to see on one of these cards. I I think that the UFC had covered themselves in so much mud that whatever came out of it, if they pulled out of the bag, Conor McGregor versus Nathan Diaz 3, that's the only sort of fight of the magnitude that they are looking for that would garner the sort of reaction that they wanted. But from a sporting perspective, even if they pull out Conor McGregor versus Nate Diaz three, that from a sporting perspective is garbage. Neither have fought, fought in ages. Getting a win is tough. The last win for Nate Diaz is Tony Ferguson and we know where he is. The last win for Conor McGregor is years ago. And so, you know, it's always going to be when the UFC 300 main event wasn't announced sort of immediately at the apex of the card, it was always going to be tough to, to turn the spin to good press, right? Putting Alex Bahia in there, he's obviously a fan favorite, big star at the moment. He is certainly somebody that will drive pay-per-view sales but english isn't his first language and so they're not going to be getting him doing an absolute fuck ton of media for this that's going to hurt them a little bit jamahal hill isn't the biggest talker right isn't the biggest name um is much more of a if the hardcore's the hardcores would know who he is right but but maybe some others wouldn't know who he is even if he's won the championship but in terms of just a pure fight, it's great. Let's yeah. not get away from it. It's fucking brilliant. Great fight. 
what do you think about Jamal Hill coming back so soon after such a serious injury? It's got to be a worry here, and it's got to be a worry in, in terms of preparation too, where if he re-injures that again, you could be left with, really left with your pants down here for this main event. Yeah, I mean, look, one, you have to think about he's only got a few weeks to prep, but two, when he was there at 298, he was asked about how did this come together, and he said it came together in the last 48 That's hours. Yeah. That fella has not been in fight camp. And so he does not know if he can trust his body or not. And if you can't trust your body and you're going into not just, lads, a fight camp, not just a main event fight camp, not just a main event fight camp against Alex Bahia, the biggest card of the year for the UFC, you have to be able to trust your body. And boy, oh boy, it's... um. It's a tough one. That is a tough one. It is. It's I, the first I, thing that I the first thing that I thought of when I thought found out was like seven months for an Achilles injury. Now it came out and said that Dana White mentioned something that um there was this uh WNBA player that injured the her Achilles as well and went back and, and Jamal Hill kind of uh, went through the same process in her healing. She did it in the PI. Jamal Hill did it, his recovery in the PI as well. She got back in seven months and went on to be like a leading scorer, I believe, that season and stuff like that. Um, but it, in certain terms, it's a lot different going out there and playing basketball than it is throwing limbs and everything like that in the gym. So I think that's a very unfair comparison. I'd have a big worry about Jamal Hill coming in here. Even if he does come in and he doesn't get injured, how ready is he going to be in seven weeks to turn around? Even with Alex Bahia, you know, he's been off traveling a little bit as well. And I mean, what do you make of this whole kind of charade around this main event? Leon Edwards offered three fights. Dana White came out and said, you know, thank you very much. He he said yes to um he said yes to Shavkat Rachmanov, Hamza Shemaev. And Islam Mahachev, all he uh, Leon agreed to fight all three of those guys. Didn't obviously turn out or materialize. Obviously, it was turned away from all three of those guys as well. But they left themselves in a little bit of a mess in setting up this UFC 300 main event, and kind of it's going to have a domino effect on this UFC Brazil card, which happens only 21 days after, where you have Charles Oliveira who's fighting on the card, and now Alex Bahia, and I believe that this. Hill versus Bahia fight was going to be originally slated for 3 0 1. They've had to move it back now, and it kind of leaves themselves in a little bit of a tizzy. And it begs to it begs the question, uh, Harry, is that how far and how well are the UFC looking ahead with these cards? Because it looks like they're kind of making it up as they go along these days, which historically is not like the company. We could spend an hour and a half on just this topic, <laughs> I think, but. It is evident to me that the UFC have been ringing it in a little bit of late. We've talked about the ESPN deal. We've talked about this. We've talked about that. But it's very hard when you're trying to grease wheels and oil cogs that haven't been oiled or greased in a long time. And it's very, very difficult for the UFC now coming into the year where they're going to need to negotiate a new TV deal they are starting to say, okay, we're putting all the big boys out. Conor McGregor will come out in the fall. And, you know, our, our main piece is Sean O'Malley's fighting this year. Tapori is going to definitely fight this year. Wouldn't surprise me if they do um, a show in Spain. That's a big selling point for TV deal type people. It's a massive deal for Europe. Like, there are these landmark sort of events that are that are going to happen. But the biggest one you should have been planning this a year ago. You know what I mean? Like you get your ducks in a row a year in advance because the fight game over a year, so much can happen and so much can change that you need to make sure you're lining up the athletes that you want to be on 300 so that if there are any injuries or life events or whatever it is, that you can get yourself in a position that they can be available or the most of them could be available for 300. And, um, yeah, it certainly doesn't feel and, like. And even and even the announcement, uh, 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 an Instagram post at 
midnight my time, seven o'clock in the morning your time. I mean, we had the lead up to UFC 200 with the Brock Lesnar promo, the DC and John Jones promo, which just fell through at the debt as well. Um, it's, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand why. Maybe there is a logistical answer, but it's like I think the term phoning it in is the true terminology here for UFC. And at the end of the day, they're still getting these packed out arenas. They're still breaking records. And they're probably like, well, if we're still doing this, why should we be putting extra money into promotion and stuff like that? But I mean, let's try and make something that's already going to be big, a little bit bigger. Like let's just try let on as a company actually care about promoting these fights somewhat and have at least a little bit of respect to the fighters that are in these positions have a little bit of respect for a guy like Alex Bahia and Jamal Hill, who've really got you out of a tizzy here, to be honest, in, in taking this co-main event as well. And, and I hope Jamal Hill and Alex Bahia are getting paid for this as well. I, I would expect Jamal Hill is for sure for taking this at very, very short notice. And I hope that Alex Bahia is, and last but not least, let's talk about Alex Bahia and what he has been able to achieve in such a young mixed martial arts career, Harry. Double champion in the middleweight and light heavyweight division, headlining Madison Square Gardens, headlining the UFC 300 uh, card, a bona fide star and a, a recipe that should not work but it's worked for Alex Bahia because you know what he, do, he does as well? And this is this is a rise and this is success based off nothing, only raw talent and determination inside the cage because he's not going to go out and cut a great promo. He's going to go in there and he's going to absolutely look to throw his, his, fi his fist right through your forehead. He's going to try and kick the legs off you and he's just absolutely frightening to watch. I love watching Alex Bahia. I'm very happy that the, the, I get to see him at UFC 300. I think a guy of his stature and his excitement, you know, you know, you're going to get a, an excitable fight. Um, look at, is it a blockbuster fight for 300? No, it's not. But this kind of encapsulates the fantastic rise of Alex Bahia over the last couple of years, Harry. And if there's anyone that deserves this spot what, what, for what he's done, the chances that he's taken and the dedication that he's shown uh, over the last couple of years, it, it is him. It is put you in. It is Alex Bahia, and um, yeah, he has to go out there and get the job done. I agree. And um, again, it's a testament to let the skills do the talking, right? Have a brand, but the brand should be centered around your skills. It shouldn't be around your talking, shouldn't be around this, it shouldn't be around that. And look, he's done his fair share of shit talking, right? Him and Israel went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, but it was about the fighting, right? It was about the fighting. And when you look at Poetan, when you look at the way he strikes, when you look at the way he is, his overall demeanor, like it's just, it is a natural star. It's not a, it's not a created image, right? It's not, it's not something that's fabricated. It's not something that's necessarily elevated. It is just who he is. And I think that's why people gravitate towards him. That's why the UFC have sent him on a rocket ship to the moon alongside his skills. And all in all, we're just very, very privileged that we've been able to see somebody like him choose MMA because he definitely didn't need to choose MMA. I'm sure he could have stayed in kickboxing and made a good living. Obviously, he'll be making a far, far, far superior living from MMA and fair play to him. But Jamahal Hill, Alex Bahia, fantastic fight. Fantastic fight. And... um I I don't think Alex Bahia loses. I think he probably destroys Jamal Hill relatively handy. Yeah, and I think that's why this fight was kind of set up and put there too. It's yeah. uh, and 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 I I might have a different opinion on this fight. I I, I think a full camp uh, Jamal Hill, you know, can cause some problems, but I still yeah. think that. Alex Bahia gets the win there. I think under the current circumstances, the quick turnaround after the injury um, and the minimal amount of time to prepare, I think the, the writing is on the wall for Jamahal Hill in this fight. And, and I think the UFC might see that as well in putting him into this position where they're hoping that we get to see another exciting knockout from, from the light heavyweight champion. And uh, look at, I think this fight on top of everything else on the 300 card makes it a f absolutely monstrous card. 
and a card that I'm really, really looking forward to 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 watching. And we'll break it down in more detail, obviously closer to the time as well. Um, that was the severe setup episode seven, UFC Mexico, PFL, Bellator. We'll take a look at one or both of those cards, possibly on the on 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 the balance breakdown next week. We might pick and choose which fights we. Uh, choose to break down depending on what level of action that we are delivered until then enjoy the fights this weekend give Harry Powell a follow over there at BJJ underscore Harry Powell at Balance Grappling on Instagram we'll talk to you soon guys take care